you're singing along to a music video. You go to look up the lyrics, but the music stops. YouTube Premium has background play, so you can switch apps and keep listening. Try YouTube Premium with one month free and sing uninterrupted. Hello everyone and good evening to all. My name is Omari Souza and I'm an assistant professor of communication design. On behalf of Texas State University, I would like to welcome you all to the State of Black Design. Tonight we'll feature prominent design leaders, academics, organizers, and activists. Our collective will be split across four categories, industry, professional organizations, academia, and design activism. Our first panel will explore the latest ideas, trends, current events, and positionalities in the field of design. Panelists will share their insights, from their personal experience and expertise, both as a method to expand voices and to increase diversity. Please allow me to introduce. First, Becca Markham. Pronouns, she and her, product designer slash organizer of Black Designers of Seattle. Samuel Adur Aduramola. Uh, pronouns he, him, forgive me for mispronouncing your name, uh, creative director at Grassroot Law Project, Renee Reed, UBEX design researcher at LinkedIn, and Erwin Hines, creative director at Basic Agency. The very first question okay. that we'll ask today, I'm sorry. The very first question that we'll ask today is that there is a historical perpetuation of racist tropes in the design industry from packaging like Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben, fashion brands that have been inspired by blackface, architectural redlining and inaccessibility. And sports teams like uh, Washington football team, which recently just rebranded their, uh, their, their trademark. What should our resp response be as black designers to these, uh, the recent uh, move to rebranding a lot of these racist um, trademarks of the past that still exist today? So I'll, I'll jump in. Um, all right. So I think it's a very nuanced thing, right? Like I, I think rebranding is table stakes. That's great. But at the same time, I've been speaking a lot about the idea of space identity, which is uh, a term that's used within the space of urban planning. And it just acknowledges the fact that the buildings that exist in cities and neighborhoods, they're not just backdrops to, to the lives we live, but they actually inform how we see ourselves and how people see us. And they inform our identity and what we tell ourselves about ourselves in the future. So they actually inform how we develop. In the same way, brands have actually created that same thing, right? They they hold space in people's hearts and their minds. And in such, they've actually shaped the perception of individuals, uh, oftentimes utilizing uh, the, the energy, the sauce, the dopeness from marginalized communities, but erasing the blackness. And they only tell one specific or a very narrow story of that blackness without acknowledging the black part. And so what that ends up doing is it, it, it again, it, it narrows, it narrows other people's perception of who we are, other people's perception of the power that we have, the energy that we have and paints uh, a one dimensional thing. And so, yes, they should rebrand, but at the same time, the, the trajectory that they have created within society based on all of the images that they have put out there, uh, that doesn't change with them just changing their logo. That doesn't erase with them just erasing or changing their packaging. So I think on top of rebranding, they actually need to do the internal work, obviously, but they also need to step up and utilize that platform that they built on the backs of, and I'm just speaking for, for, for me as a black man, on the backs of blackness and acknowledge it and speak about it and actually talk about the nuances and beauty of blackness and bring in black creatives and, and, and black leaders within those organizations to tell those stories in an authentic manner. Because to me, the future of brands is 
uh, are, are brands that are actually not only like outwardly showcasing that they support, but they're um, corporate citizens and they're platform brands that actually act as a platform for the voices and the people that support them, i.e. something like a Nike, right? Like they step up, of course, they're not perfect, but they step up and they actually provide platforms for, for individual stories. They provide platforms for people like LeBron James to actually do what he's doing. And to me, like that's the direction these brands should move in if they've been built on the backs of these stories um, of blackness. I think that's actually a great answer and it's awesome segue into our next question. Um, now more than ever, it's necessary for black voices to be at the table when creating design approaches for our communities. How do we get more black voices and talent into the design industry? I will go ahead and start off here. First, I just want to take a moment and just acknowledge this space that we have here to just hold these authentic conversations. And uh, for everyone who's watching, you are in for a treat for the next two hours. So sit back, relax, take your pens, papers, notepads, get to snap in. Uh, this is going to be a good time. So um, thank you, Amari, and for your team for putting this together. So uh, Black voices and Black design at the table. I want to push this question a little bit further. I think we've been talking about getting design at the table for a while and definitely getting Black voices and presence at the table. I like to uh, be a little bit of a provoker and push that to say we need position at the table, not just presence at the table. So who is at the head of the table making the decisions? Who is the highest person paid in that room? And I think that's where we need to start pushing these conversations of not just having Black presence in the room, but who are the decision makers that are representative of the communities that we're trying to bring in as well. So, you know, in a amazing um, rush of talent that's coming into design, that's been in design, I want to start seeing, or I'm going to say I want to, but um, it's important for the industry to start pushing these individuals and communities up and supporting these communities, not just at the table, but beyond uh, to have that presence and position. And then listen, if you know people don't want to come to the table because they don't have a voice or a space, let us support those who build their own table as well. I think that's an awesome answer. I just wanted to take a moment to, to acknowledge how awesome I think both your head wrap and your spiral staircases in the background. I, uh, I'm, I'm admiring both. They're both, they're both pretty awesome. Um, the next question I wanted to ask is, um, is the industry pulling up black talent from the collegiate level effectively? And if not, how can we better attract black talent into the field from the collegiate level? So I'll sneak in here. Um, I would say not enough. Like I personally, I've seen like some folks start to do it. Like I sent my own recruiter to um, a historically black college like a week ago because um, there was some event there. But I would say that there's too many folks who are going to colleges that have design departments that aren't diverse. And they're surprised when they're not pulling in these diverse candidates, which is 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 absurd. And so. It's like people need to go to the historically black colleges, go to you know the community colleges that are more accessible to POCs, um, and actually you know go to the places where these people are um, in order to do that. But that takes time, and so it's like there it's so important to invest your energy instead of just words, which are useless. Like it, it's really easy to have that talk and say yes, we want to bring in you know, more designers of color, um, but actually taking the steps and do, doing the legwork, um, finding people that you may have not found if you just put it out online is is so, so important. And then keeping them is also key. I think that's am, I able to, am I able to chime in? With of course. Like, all right, so just building off of those two points, um, I just want people to acknowledge the, the what minority and what black designers bring to the table at the end of the day we've had to hold space for everybody else our entire life therefore we are very empathetic and we are coming at things with a very universal mindset 
And when you have a bunch of white designers and white creatives creating for the world, they're not creating for the world, they're creating for themselves because they can only create for themselves based on their perspective and what they've been taught. They've been taught their history. They've been taught uh, about people who look like them. So every time they actually come to the table, they can only analyze everybody else in terms of data and data points, which doesn't actually give you a very human or nuanced uh, concept or perception of that individual. So it's essentially they end up creating something that's very narrow and doesn't have as much impact. And so if you wanna truly have impact as a brand and as an organization, let black designers have a have a uh, seat at the table and not only have a seat at the table, but be the head of the table because they are the ones who are actually able to understand with a more nuanced perspective um, the world. Not only white people because we learned about them, but a lot of other cultures because we learned about them in school, right? Like for, for us, we had to learn about our own history at home. So no one else really knows about us other than us. And so we bring a very nuanced perspective because we had to hold space. And that's what the design industry is all about. It's about empathy and creating for other people. I'm just uh, being quiet because I really appreciate what you just said. And I'm just trying to let that soak in. Um, the next question I would ask is considering the lack of diversity in the industry, what support or lack of support is there for uh, junior design talent in the industry? Um, I'll start, but I'm gonna punt this over to Sam too so that he can uh, chime in. Um, but yeah, I think what we've seen over time is that, you know, there's, if you look at job postings and if you look at just how teams have been structured, you know, all through the industry, there's a lot of heavy focus on senior talent um, and people who've been in industry for some time. And I think there has to be um, some intentional effort to make sure that the younger designers are getting the opportunity to sit in and be in these spaces um, where they can learn, where they can grow um, at all different levels, right? And I think what's unfortunately happening, especially for Black designers who are graduating from programs that may not be as familiar or popular in terms of like big PWI type programs, um, they're getting left behind and they're not getting um, probably that same opportunity to get those internships like some uh, of their counterparts who are part of uh, bigger programs. Um, I also challenge organizations and the industry to say, listen, you know, bringing in senior talent is great. You want leadership, you want people who have, have understanding, but let's face it, when, you, when you've been doing something for so long, you're, you're biased to your own work. You're probably, you know, just doing some of the same things and you're probably a little bit harder to teach uh, because you've just been doing things for a long time. So getting someone who has new perspective, who is hungry, who just wants to learn, 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 you know, that's a great addition to a team, uh, to a culture. So, um, and to help cultivate those young uh, minds into, you know, hopefully great leaders. So I think we as an organization, as organizations, as industry have to do our part to make sure that we're cultivating space and opportunity for young black designers, for junior designers, so that they too can grow, have this trajectory um, and be a part uh, of the growth um, and be the leaders in the industry in, in the future and, and do amazing things because they are doing some amazing stuff now. We just need to give them uh, that opportunity. Sam. Yeah, and if I, if I may, I I'd also want to shout out those who have taken like untraditional paths who didn't get the opportunity to go, you know, to a, a premier school on either coast or to have to reevaluate their career much further along. Um, and those people do still offer rich experiences and you know they may be junior in design but they're senior in other aspects that can influence a lot of decisions that are you know design-based decisions so I just wanted to also throw it out there that that's something that's also very, uh, worth worth considering I think that's awesome and uh, Sam I apologize again for mispronouncing your last name could you yes. could you correct me so that we put we put adequate respect on your name do you want the accent or not Yes, please. <laughs> Adarabola from the from Nigeria. That's a Nigerian last name. I, I 
I respect that. All right. So my next question, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick to you as well, sir. Um, mm -hmm. As an accomplished professional in the industry, could you a list and, and explain uh, some of the barriers you had to overcome as a person of color? And b mm -hmm. um, has there been any noticeable changes, industry changes in your treatment since uh, the recent Black Lives Matter protests? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm a I'm a black man. If you can't can't tell by looking, um, but I'm I'm a I'm an immigrant as well, and I, I spent majority of my life undocumented, undocumented uh, rather, and I faced a deportation at one point in time, um, and. Uh, I'm, I'm what you would consider a dreamer, uh, but uh, I didn't have DACA, I wasn't available at the time I was facing deportation. I also grew up in, in low income, in a low income household and I'm a first generation college student, graduate. And uh, when I think about what led to my career path, it's always been a journey that's been constantly overcoming barriers. And I think knowing why my parents left Nigeria to come to, an, uh, come to America a country with uh, generations that still know uh, colonization and the damage that has done. I think by about why it takes longer for uh, immigrant cases to be processed for for green cards and permanent residence for people from Black countries and Latin American countries than it does for people who come from European countries. And also growing up, you know, in that low income, you kind of feel like all these things are happening to you because you're Black. And it's not until you kind of grow up that you realize that these things are happening because they were designed to happen that way. There's a reason that we have uh, 45 in the White House who is only banning certain countries and, and not others from, from coming into America. So my perspective is kind of like a, a Black globalist perspective, an Africanist, if you will, perspective that identifies that you know, blackness, blackness is, is universal. And we are going through things in America that people are, you know, black other black people are going through in South America and in Europe and, and all over the place. Um, but for me, uh, I kind of, and I think for a lot of black people, you know, I, I stumbled into design out of survival. You know, I couldn't get the name brand clothes, so I had to like draw on shirts, draw on shoes myself. You know, I literally. Uh, paid rent in college, um, paid tuition in college by throwing parties. And I had to design those flyers. I learned Photoshop by designing flyers to get people to come to those parties. So it was a, it was a means of survival. Uh, so, and there's also this barrier uh, for me that I had to prove to my friends and family, well, mostly my family, and honestly to myself that, you know, design is a, is a viable career path. Cause I, you know, most people who, uh, who are coming from low income families, who are first generation, you know, you're the first. So you, you're thinking about what's gonna be the career path that is just gonna have the most money, not necessarily what you're most interested in. Uh, so there's that, that, that barrier of overcoming the pressure of becoming a doctor or lawyer or engineer, you know, and actually do something that you're, you're interested in. And the second part of your question about noticeable changes in, in the wake of the protests and, you know, dating back to Ferguson most recently, uh, you, you can name a lot of names of, of, of these victims, like, especially this year, there's been a turning point, it seems, and I'm sure a lot of the panelists here can, 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 uh, can attest that, you know, they've gotten approached by non-Black people asking, like, what can we do? And I just really feel that, you know, we as Black people are overburdened with being the solutions for problems that we ourselves did not create. And, and be that as it may, like we still have to look out for our own. You know, when we're able to get past the gate, we have to hold the gate open and, and make sure that we bring others in. And I respect a lot of the panelists here that, that you'll hear from who, who are creating these spaces. But honestly, we, we can't do it ourselves. We need those allies. We need people to speak up and advocate for us. And if you look to your left and you look to your right, and you see that the people that are around you look like you, talk like you, act like you, there's a problem there. And we here, the best we can do is advocate for ourselves and, and advocate for, for others and use these spaces and continue to build on these spaces so that we can you know, s stop forcing the gate open because get, it gets tiring holding that gate open. You know, We need somebody there to hold it for us, so yeah. 
jumping in on that actually. I, I work in tech and for me, the issue getting in was access. You know, with tech, they love the referral culture. And so it's great for the individual. It's great for someone who's gonna rack up those bonuses, but it creates an entire divide that really perpetuates this, you know, fully homogenous workforce. You know, cause like if I, if I as an individual are gonna reach out to my community and bring people in, you know, when only 3% of the design community is black, then, you know, it, it, it's pretty much gonna stay the same or get worse. And I think that is just a massive, when you tie that in with people not actually going to these black spaces to find this talent that creates a huge problem. But kind of with what Sam was saying, once these very few and far between black folks get into these spaces, they're then, you know, they're then expected to solve the problems of that space. And so I think since the whole BLM, since like all the protests started, I have honestly heard too much uh, about companies spinning up these initiatives, these groups, these whatever else um, to help with their diversity issues. Um, and most of those are by like voluntelling their black and POC employees to like help them out. And there's no additional compensation. There's no, uh, you know, just reorganizing of the work in order to one, pay them for, uh, for what they're doing, but then also be cognizant of the emotional toll that your black employees or your POC employees are having to take in their workplace um, and just rehashing their black trauma for the betterment of a company. And so it's like, if you're going to have that, first of all, make a space where they're not expected to your, be your racism guru in this time, but then also make sure that you're compensating them accordingly. Um, whether that is time, whether that is having a like access to like black mental health professionals to help them with this time. It's like, that is so necessary. So you're not just like burning out these people in the workforce because they're already dealing with microaggressions. Like they're already dealing with being the only one in their spaces. And so it's like, how are you going to make sure you can hold on to this talent that's so necessary? Because like, as Erwin was saying, they bring something that is totally different to the table. It's like, we've been code switching all our lives. And so we're able to realize what, like who, how we show up in different areas and see how people perceive us. So we can say like, hey, you know what? This is not design. Different people are gonna come to it in different ways. And so it's like, you, it not only has to be recognized with that value, but then it also has to be compensated. Yeah, and if I may, um, I don't know where we're at with time, but it, it kind of makes me think about the first question about uh, is rebranding enough? And I think we as designers here, you know, my, my colleagues here, they can attest. I think when people often think of rebrand, they just think, oh, we need a new logo. Oh, we need a color palette. Oh, let's switch up the pattern. Uh, but it's also those intangible things, like what are our values? How are we showing up for people? Uh, uh, how are we delivering on the promises? Are we keeping those promises? Um, a new logo is not gonna fix institutional racism. You know, a new color palette is not gonna fix bigotry. All right, so when you think about rebranding, you also have to think about how you're going to uh, restructure who's showing up, you know, who's in that room, you know, so we don't have people thinking a can of Pepsi is going to solve police brutality, you know what I'm saying? So we got to make sure that people are in those rooms, you know, when we, when we, when you have these uh oh moments, like a lot of these, uh, you know, the Washington football team, I'm, I'm from the DMV, I support them, I was so happy. When they changed the name, I believe we were cursed for many seasons because we had that that stupid name. Um, and shout out to us for winning our first game. Uh, but you know, these organizations you know, like Aunt Jemima and all these places, they they've existed for over a hundred years and they have refused to adapt with the time. So it makes you question, you know, who are they keeping out from being in those rooms? Like, why did it have to take a hundred plus years for you to finally change the name? For you to finally think about not having that that packaging. So I think when we think about rebranding, it has to be more than just the bells and whistles. It has to be like, who's on the board? You know, who's making these decisions? Let's rebrand that first. Yeah, it's a evolution and a revolution of just reconstruction and of just reconstructing things where there's actually things that need to be deconstructed things that need to be torn down and then rebuilt versus just kind of flipping it around and just doing something different and restructuring. No, there needs to be 
um, a total destruction of it and just kind of taking a step back and, and rebuilding. And that's not the case in every situation, but there's certain things where um, if it's just perform for performative and it's not about progression and really progress, then it's all for show, it's very temporary. And so during these times to your uh, point, Becca, of you know everyone just kind of showing up or Sam, you're mentioning to everyone changing all their logos and things like that. I think what's gonna be really important is the accountability part in all of this post BLL, well, it's not fucking post, we're still in this, but um, the accountability of how did you show up right after, but how did you show up a year from now, two years from now, what does that progress and that progression look like from internships, from people being in the room? I actually, I was just thinking while you were all were talking, I was like, we always talk about seat like it's a singular thing. We need to be having seats. It needs to be plural, you know, it needs to be just this full representation in these spaces um, that at this time where people are listening. I will also say that we have a responsibility that our voices need to be even louder. So even if you have that seat at the table, if you're not using that seat to help move everyone along, then I will challenge you to either make way for someone else to come um, and be a voice or and step aside a little bit because that is an opportunity and a privilege to have and hold that space. So yes, take up space when you get it, hold that space, but don't just toss it away. Um, and I think in this, you know, like you mentioned in the Mari in your question about kind of what's happening now since the BLM, BLM and everyone's listening because everyone had a chance to be still. I think this is the time where we do um, just have a lot more of a, a stance and a presence. I will say this one last thing. I'm sorry, uh, I'll let you go, Erin. And um, even in the times when I was the only Black woman in a room, people would always ask me, how did you hold your space or be able to find that confidence to speak your truth? And I dug my heels into the fact that I always knew that there were tens, if not hundreds of thousands of my ancestors walking in that room with me and in that room with me. And so I bring that strength and that power. And so I literally can physically feel and see um, the presence. And so that's what usually takes me over, but I want that to uh, translate into the physical as well and see my people in the room. I think you guys made a lot of beautiful points just now. Um, I know we have about two or three minutes before we have to jump to the next panel um, to take care of a couple of quick uh, things. If you guys aren't aware, you can live tweet with us, um, hashtag state of black design. Um, you can also subscribe to the YouTube channel for future programming. Um, and jumping back into this, one thing I wanted to say is I have deep, deep, deep admiration and respect for you guys and the accomplishments that you guys have made in industry and practice. Um, I know that whenever we've talked privately, um, that's one thing that I always do um, bring up and mention is my adoration and, and respect for where you guys are and the things that you've been able to accomplish. Also being a first generation American, um, you know, uh, there is this expectation that you, you, you have to go out and do great things to set the example for those that are coming up behind you. Um, but being first generation, you know, it's it's hard when you don't have that representation, um, people that look like you within industry that are rep represented. So the final question I have for the four of you can, and, and please forgive me because I'm not leaving you guys much time is, if you could speak to yourselves as freshmen, what advice would you give yourself? Um, and this is, this is the metaphorical you because there are students that are watching this now that are in their freshman foundation years of college. So if you can give me maybe 10 seconds, 15 seconds a piece, what advice would you give uh, freshman you? Eden, or Erwin, sorry. Erwin, let's start with you. <laughs> uh, I think it actually rolls off of uh, Renee's point. Bring, I would have told myself to bring my full self and to know that I have the strength of all of my ancestors with me. And that is the beauty of black culture. While, while Candace, Candace Owens was like, why do you guys support each other? And like, that's the problem with black people. We, we reach back to support the least of us. And like, that's what's great about us. 
we have always stood with each other, stood with each other as a community. To me, we are the foundation of what represents freedom in America. We fought for the freedoms that everybody enjoys. And so to me, it's recognizing our strengths, dig into your history. If you are a young black person, dig into your history, understand you come from greatness. Um, and everywhere you go, you are bringing that greatness with you. Every brand, every company, every organization wants to pull from what is your culture, what is of you. And, and on top of that, I would say, look to create your own things, own your own things, create your own spaces so that you can actually create spaces and opportunities for others. While I don't like all of Tyler Perry's movies, obviously, I do love the fact that he owns everything. He created a space that he can now hire. And to me, if, if people are profiting on our culture, there's something there, obviously. So why can't we profit? Why can't we pave the golden roads for ourselves? And I would say like, look at your story, understand your story, understand your power, because your story is what writes culture, what writes the future, and culture is what drives commerce. All right. I I love all of that. I <laughs> I, I really do. I um I want to thank you guys. I feel like you guys shared some really insightful things and I just look forward to see what people have to say about some of the, the pieces that you guys shared. Again, I have the utmost respect and love for you guys and the stuff that you do. Um, and I look forward to continuing to collaborate with you guys in the future. All right. Set my head off to you guys. All right. Thank you, Omar. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're gonna jump into our second panel, which is about black professional collectives. Um, the Black Collectives panel will feature prominent leaders in the Black design community. This discussion will explore the need for safe spaces for designers of color and provide details on how predominantly white institutions have neglected voices of color. Um, on this panel, we have Maurice Sherry, he, him, his, founder and host of Revision Path, one of my favorite podcasts. And if you're not subscribed, you should do so now. Um, we have Becca Markham, uh, still joining us from our first panel. Uh, we have Jacinda Walker, she, her, and hers, founder and creative director of Design Explorer. And we have Terrence Maline, um, he, him, his, and founder of AAGD, African American Graphic Designers. I'd like to welcome you guys. How are you guys doing? Good. Pretty good. Hi. I just want to talk about the last, like, last panel, but like for like two more hours. So <laughs> we'll have to schedule another one, which I'm pretty sure is going to happen after each one. I, yeah, next time we're just gonna have to do this for a little bit longer. But I, I, I know that you guys are gonna bring some uh, insightful um, tidbits for this one as well too. So let's uh, let's let's jump in. Um, the lack of diversity in design workspace acts as a gate, which keeps voices uh, within the Black community out of the design and creation process. Um, are there actual safe spaces for Black designers in the industry, or in collective organizations related to the industry? I can have Maurice, you want to take this one or I can have I'll, I'll start it off. Yeah, sure. Okay. Why not? Uh, do I think there are actual safe spaces for black designers um, in sort of like workplaces? Absolutely not. I don't. Um, I've seen where certainly there are companies that may create, you know, employee resource groups and things of that nature, uh, which I think are great. Those are always great to have workers kind of bond together over a shared affinity. But those are still in some aspect ruled over by whomever might be in the C-suite that is not a black person or not a person of color. Um, and I say not a person of color because oftentimes whiteness doesn't necessarily manifest itself through white people. There can be certain sort of insidious aspects that crop up from non-black people of color. However, uh, do I think that there are the, these safe spaces within those kinds of organizations? I, I really don't. I think uh, there's only so far that you can go when it comes to that, because you're still sort of bound by whatever the, the rules are, wherever it is you work, an employee handbook or something like that. Um, so inside corporate workspaces, I'm, I'm not convinced of that. Becca, do you want to add in? Yeah, I mean, all of that. I would say that it's absolutely true because I mean, even by the definition of like again there's only three percent of black folks in the 
in the workforce as far as design. There is no like there's really no ability to, you know, there, there's there's so so much structural uh, prejudice, prejudices and racism that, you know, that that do affect you. Like if I'm a very vocal person in the workplace, like I used to congratulate my manager every year on my anniversary for I was like, hey, this is a year that your team got 100% more diverse. And it was but it was still a thing where it's like, however more I was going to talk about race, talk about design, it was like it, it, it almost became a like, oh, well, she's it, it's just a big thing for her, but it's not actually the case. And so it's I think it's for safe spaces, um, being able to actually like show up when we're still in like a design industry that puts things out like you know, the coolest monkey in the jungle shirt with like H&M. Like I think, I think that in itself kind of shows that it's not, it's not quite safe for people to fully speak up. So I, I kind of define safe spaces as being somewhere where you could be without filters or masks. And uh, I do believe that that exists, not, not within corporate, but there, there are spaces right now, there, there are conferences like the Hue Design Summit, which is absolutely beautiful. It's like uh, Du Bois' dream of heaven where there's so much melanin and you're in this big room and everybody's communing like family. It's awesome. Um, and there are places like uh, within where of the black designers, there's um, a black caucus where you completely can be uh, full black. And there's also places like Ethos Club online. So I'm really really happy to see so many new places popping up where we can feel safe. Jacinda, what do you think? I'm horribly biased. I have to agree with Maurice 112% because ultimately this is why I chose entrepreneurship because the, the concept of safe spaces in corporate places, it's like a, a dual mixed type of thing, right? Like the very person who typically is over the company do they really want it safe? Do they really want it safe? Like, do they really? I don't know. I mean, it's not been the experience that I've had. And so in understanding that, unless I create the space, then it's probably not the safe that I, how I would define safe. So if I want, if I need that, if I need it to be safe, for me, it was about making it myself and determining what was going to be in and who was going to be in it and why it was going to be happening and not being held back or held down by some other person's vision who was never really mine. And I was only reliant upon them to give me this piddly two week check. So for me, I just took all of that off the table and I just started my own business where I know the safe, the space is safe. And actually just like really, really fast for being back in on that. I think even the need for ERGs to create a safe space within a company <laughs> kind of shows that the company itself is not a safe space. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And so it's like, it, 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 you have all these affinity <laughs> groups that are supposed to provide like, you know, when, whenever someone will come up to me like, oh, you know, you should come to our company, whatever else, they'll like, they'll work hard. They'll like pimp the, you know, the ERGs like crazy. And it's like, well, are you telling me that I'm not going to get what I need from your team? Is that, is that what you're telling me? It's like, I'm going to have to go elsewhere, um, invest my other time again, which is not probably going to be like compensated for. Um, it's going to be like outside of the workday in order for me to be fulfilled and feel safe in this area. And, and, and ultimately, I love that, Becca. It's like, so you want me to join the ERG because you know it's not safe here and you know it's a culture problem here and you know it can be a little challenging. So we're supposed to like fellowship to bond together against the man. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I, that's why I chose, uh, Omari, that's why I chose entrepreneurship. It, it was just a, a much better route for me. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a seasoned designer, right? Like I've, I've played the game already a couple times, maybe a few times. I played the game and I'm just not up for it anymore. And so I think it's important to have the, the, it's important to be in the space to recognize, ooh, this ain't it, but don't stay. You know what I'm saying? Like when you recognize it, don't stay and, or at least figure out where you can be at that is safe. Cause that's ultimately what you should be striving for in your career is safe. I appreciate you guys for sharing those perspectives. I think you guys all provided great and awesome insights. The next question I have is um, somewhat related. Um, each of you have had your past experiences with other design organizations prior to establishing your own. 
what were some of the experiences you had with those organizations? And then what was your motivation to starting your own collective design group? I'll start with that one. Um, I've always jokingly referred to a lot of the other organizations as the white student union. And it has always been my job to start the black student union. There was never a doubt. It was just, I saw that there was a need. And since college, I was like, you know what? I've got to start this, it's my job. Um, and it wasn't easy because reaching out to other African-Americans, they didn't always, they weren't always receptive. Oh. Um, and the honest truth about those um, national organizations is I've actually never had a problem at all, but I've always kept them at arm's length because I didn't, I'm, so I primarily grew up in an all white neighborhood. I went to a predominantly white high school, predominantly white uh, church, predominantly white college, and I lived in Austin. So I'm very familiar with the ways of white people. It's, it's no big deal for me to walk into a room full of white people. Um, and some of my best friends are white. So we always have these conversations about race that are like really intense, um, but we also find ways to resolve them. And they would ask me questions like, uh, how would you feel if I started a white student union? Because you have the black student union, it's not fair. To... And I was just like, you know what? Since you're so concerned about race, you really should start a white student union and you should be the president. And then part of that goal should be to celebrate your heritage, to celebrate your heroes, to celebrate your failures, to celebrate the horrors. And then you bring your full whiteness and I'll bring my full whiteness and then we'll work on problems on the campus together. So I've always seen those organizations as a place that were open, uh, but not really for me. Um, so um, it was just always my job to do something like this. And it has been full of rewards. Um, I'm also having my uh, Malcolm after Mecca moment where I'm kind of like changing and being a little bit more open and giving a little bit more of my time. And I'm seeing that there are a lot of common struggles because there's this superordinate identity of being a designer that we can all cling to. Um, but I'm going to digress because I would love to hear from other people on this panel. Maurice, I've been a fan of yours since the uh, Black Weblog Awards. So uh, I'd love to hear why you started this space. Oh, okay. Where to begin? Uh, so my, you know, my, my interaction with design organizations have been uh, kind of shaky, I think, at best. Uh, you kind of never really know where you're coming in in terms of how the work that you're doing is going to be perceived by them either as a deficit that they're not able to do or something that they want to bring in to kind of make themselves look better. Um, I had the privilege of serving on AIGA's National Diversity and Inclusion Task Force for a number of years. Uh, and even within the confines of doing that at the national level, there were still so many restrictions and things that couldn't be done that we couldn't do, you know, all of us on the task force being people of color because the white person who was the strategic director or whomever that was over the, the task force was sort of the gatekeeper that wouldn't allow certain things to happen. So um, it, it sort of ended up becoming this weird kind of game of telephone where the task force would do something and then it gets filtered through them and then it goes up to headquarters and it's purple monkey dishwasher attached to it. Like there's other stuff that has to go with it. And so having that kind of like weird, like gate between you trying to do the work and them trying to look good ends up being a bit of a problem. Uh, I should say I'm not I'm no longer a part of the AIGA task force. I'm actually no longer even uh, an AIGA member. However, I still do, you know, kind of keep in contact with them and with the organization and with people at different chapters because I realize that uh, as designers, we have, you know, common goals to solve problems. I don't think that the organization, at least that particular organization, given its age, it is over a hundred years old, um, is going to change anytime soon. I think it is too bound by tradition and probably shackled a little bit by corporate fealty. I mean, you don't really want to piss off the people that could write you checks that can keep your organization in order. So there's a certain kind of level that you have to keep. And oftentimes black people are under that level. I'm sorry, I felt like that needed a pause as well. <laughs> um, uh, Becca, did you want to add to that as well? I mean, they said so much of it. I was just so used to being the only one in my space, whether that was the only black chick 
at a, a design event, whether that's AIGA or whatever else, um, or honestly, even even with the, within these internal ERGs, it's the only designer that in those spaces. And so it's like, you know, blackness is a great thing for us to come around and, you know, really talk about, but like black design is like a whole nother thing. It's a whole nother industry. I just remember going and trying to really be involved in this ERG and, and even so like, oh yeah, I'm a designer and be like, oh, like they just like did it, just like didn't connect. And so for me, it was like even having that combination of like, what have I chosen to do with my life? And what is my, like, what is my identity that needed to come together? Um, but as far as uh, design organizations, I mean, there have been situations where I've been asked to be on a panel and then found it the day before the panel that they decided to replace me with a different black girl with a bigger title. And, you know, there, there is a lot of, you know, different spaces where it's the performative efforts that, that are causing some of, you know, that, that essentially just like perpetuate this white supremacy in these organizations. And, and, and that by itself just kind of causes like, you know, everything to go wrong. Cause you know, if, if they're not, if they're basically ch checking a box and saying, all right, we have one black, black person on this panel at the his historically black, you know, center, uh, which they actually only realized like, you know, a few weeks before the event, it's, it, it really shows kind of where the priorities are and, and what they're actually doing to fix it. Cause if, if that's, if they're ready to check a box, they're not actually, you know, prepared or willing to create actual spaces for people to congregate and really have like safety with their identity. That's, thank you. Thank you again. I think that's um, a bunch of another set of really solid points. Um, the next question I wanna ask is, what are the benefits that you guys find for designers of color within the respective groups that you've each created? Um, I actually, uh, I would love to take the first part of that answer. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, because of the work that I do, I learned long ago, um, I, I learned long ago that legacy is really ultimately where I have to put my energy in, right? And, you know, I'm, I don't have any children. And so for me, it's always about how are we setting up and what are we setting up for this next generation? Like, where will they go? Who will they call? How will they be received? Will they hear things like, oh my gosh, you speak so well for a black girl. Like, will they, will they have to hear, you know, those types of things. And so I started Design Explorer because I came to a place where I really saw the inside of how organizations operate and how the people who manage and navigate these organizations really, really think and really what their view is on commitment, being committed to diversity and inclusion. And I knew they didn't have our young people in mind. I, I knew they did not have um, plans and, and things created. I knew they did not have intentions proper to, to, to network, to nurture, to help them navigate, to help them move forward, to open doors, to be door openers. Like I knew they didn't have those. And that's what I am building Design Explorer to do, right? Um, this summer, I was super excited. I was able to place four young people into jobs, right? Like off of calls, off of a network, off of a being able to speak to someone and, and to advocate for another person under the, other than yourself. And so when I think about what, what are the benefits, it can look glossy. But you know, my mama used to always say, all that glitters is not gold. And so I think having small organizations like Design Explorer, like AAGD, right? Like Revision Pass, I think ultimately we will be the ones who make those decisions and prove to our young people where the true benefits are. Absolutely. Um, I know um, one of the benefits, it may not be feeling so safe, actually. Uh, we will give you honest critique. Mm -hmm. And if you throw something into our group that's like full of glitter or something like that, we're gonna tell you to get that shit out of here. And it's 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 yeah. not because we, we think you're whack. It's, it's, well, it's not because we think you're black. It's because your work is not meeting the standards that it needs to meet. So you can't have that as an excuse. And then we're not afraid to talk to them directly because we don't have that barrier of race to worry about. I think beyond that, so when I started my community, Black Designers of Seattle, 
it was kind of really founded, or I tried to bring, like come to it from a point of vulnerability and authenticity. So a lot of like what we've done so far, like there has been the skill sharing, but um, you know, more like a, you know, mentoring level, but I think it's been more about just like these community like discussions that we've been able to have just like as, as a family, as like a house. Um, and you know, there, there's housekeeping to do in some ways. Cause you know, even as a community, we have things like colorism, we have, you know, different, we have like, you know, we all have different backgrounds. And so our identity is also not like one being, there is not one black experience. And so being able to have these discussions and have a safe place where people feel feel welcome, it's like, I'm a light and bright black girl. And so there are some space, and from California, who camps? And there are some spaces where I can go in and people are like, oh, it's a black girl who camps or something. And so, you know, being able to bring their full self into the space um, has been something that both I have um, felt just very fulfilled by, and then also have he heard that that is something that um, is is more unique than you know than other spaces that they may have gone into. Oh, didn't realize I was on mute, but uh, thank you so much. Um, one thing I realized I didn't do a good job of when introducing you guys was actually addressing the organizations that you guys have and how people can actually support them. So I actually want to give you guys each a quick opportunity to mention um, the name of the organization and how people can actually support them. All right, I'll start off. Uh, so uh, my my podcast is Revision Path. That's at revisionpath.com. We're also on Twitter and on Instagram. It's a podcast, new episodes every Monday morning. Find it wherever you find your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. cetera. Um, also with Revision Path, there are two kind of separate projects which are underneath that. Uh, the first is 28 Days of the Web, which highlights a different Black designer and developer for every day during Black History Month. Um, and then we also have Recognize, which is our literary anthology made up of uh, d indigenous designers and people of color, which are kind of the next generation of design voices. And the best way really to support it is for a vision path, of course, is to listen. Um, if anyone would like to donate and sponsor, that's always great too. Uh, but really the best way is to just kind of spread the word about revision path, listen, give us feedbacks, you know, that's the best way. And now I'll go next. Um, Unity at AAGD or unity.aagd.co. That's the membership site. You can stop by. We also have a group on Facebook and we are doing movie night next week. So it'd be good to see y'all. Yeah, the chat is pretty lit. I'm over on the West Coast with Black Designers of Seattle, but I feel with the remote world, it's been sprinkling very much in other, in other spaces. Uh, we have a LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, and we just started a Slack channel. Um, and starting in October, we'll also be doing a Black Summit. So Designing While Black kind of events where we're actually just gonna be sharing our skills with each other. Um, and also recording those so it can start to really train and bring up others in the community. Mm -hmm. um, I have an organization, we are a social enterprise named Design Explorer. Uh, I started it after the three and a half year research project that I did analyzing the lack of diversity in design where I found that though there are tons of people interested in looking at the lack of diversity in, in design, there were no for-profit full-time businesses working to solve the problem. So everything that we do works to change the face of the design profession. We do this through corporate organizations where we do research projects for them. We do design work, design strategy pieces, design research projects, but our heart and my soul is in our youth activities where we go into underserved schools, communities, organizations. I even went into a church once and did a design challenge. Um, and we work to expose the next generation of young people to design. Um, right now we're super, super excited because even though we're in this incredible time of this pandemic, um, we were able to use our Think Like a Designer workshop series and where it was social distancing and we created 
creativity kits for young people to take home and be able to do these types of activities at home so they could learn to think like a designer and have the tools readily accessible to them. So um, anybody who's interested in purchasing um, one of my creativity kits or subscribing to be one of the young people in our Design Explorers Design Club, you can check me out on designexplorer.com. And uh, we spell Design Explorer real gangster with two R's. <laughs> I, uh, I want to thank you guys for the work that you guys actually do. Um, being honest to the point, I mean, to the points that you guys brought up in terms of safe spaces, the fact that you guys are actually doing the work and doing the hard labor on the on the ground, actually creating safe spaces for people of color. Um, they're attempting to jump into a field that doesn't have many people that look like them is extremely important. And I I support you guys at every step of the way, and I love the work that you guys do and hope that others find value in it as well. So I just wanted to make sure I gave you guys that respect and, and shared my appreciation for all the stuff that you guys have done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, you guys. So we still have a couple quick minutes before our next uh, panel. Let me... Uh, I'm not gonna throw a, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna throw a surprise around there. So um, <laughs> I wanna thank you guys again though. Um, and, and again, respect to you guys and, and hats off. Um, I'm gonna get ready to jump into our next panel. So um, our panel, uh, our academia panel will discuss the history of design, anti-racism in the classroom, as well as recommend racially inclusive changes to pedagogical practice. Um, on this panel, we have Teresa Moses, pronouns she and her, assistant professor of graphic design and director of design justice at the University of Minnesota. We have Jennifer White Johnson, pronouns she, her, they, them. My apologies, assistant professor of visual communication design, disability advocate at Bowie State University. We have Dr. Leslie Ann Noel, pronouns she, her, associate director of design thinking for social impact. Um, and we also have Angela Baines, pronouns she, her assistant professor, faculty of design at OCAD University in Toronto, Canada. I'd like to welcome you all. Thanks, Amari. Thank you. All right. You. So the first question I'm going to ask, um, Given the historically racist and colonized design history that is traditionally taught in design pedagogy, what are some of the ways that you have overcome the hegemony of design? And what do we need to truly see change, not only in the classes you teach, in the classes we teach, but in the institutions that we teach at? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna jump in and maybe not answer the question, but I'm <laughs> I'm going to try to answer it and then I'll actually I'm going to start saying that I don't teach to the canon um, because I mean fortunately I don't teach graphic design or industrial design um, anymore and it means that I have a little bit more freedom with what I'm teaching but I think that very often that design canon is um, is exclusive you know it was written for a particular group um, it, it was written in a way that it excludes a lot of people and really I focus more on process and reflexivity and collaboration and creating your own design um, path rather than teaching that okay this person is who we need to put up on a pedestal and this is what is is good design I'm always challenging that you know what is good design um, you know, and, and like in my own work, um, I'm not trying to seek validation anymore. Um, I'm kind of done with the gaslighting and the, um, you know, my own imposter, imposter syndrome or having to prove myself excessively. And I'm just doing what I know needs to be done. That's, that's where I am these days. I forgot to introduce Larry as well. Larry, I apologize. Um, Larry, King, um, pronouns he, him, former assistant professor of design and creative director of, of Glyphic Studio at Kent State University. Um, Larry was also a committee member on my thesis when I was graduating from my MFA program at Kent State University. So please forgive me and don't beat me up later for uh, forgetting to do it. <laughs> um, but uh, Angela, did you want to uh, add to that first question as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um... 
we have to be careful that we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. Um, I think when we talk about uh, hegemony, I don't think we actually do overcome it because it is actually part of who we are. We've had to grow up in this society. Um, but I do think um, what we do is we, we absorb it. And so it, we absorb it and it becomes part of our lived experience, essentially. Um, and for us, I think because of that, there's, we have a natural empathy. And I think it was Erwin who mentioned that earlier on, we have a natural empathy because of that. Um, we have an understanding, there's, there's, um, there's a type of questioning um, that we bring forth as well. And we end up just weaving that into how we express ourselves. And in doing that, we then have our own de design aesthetic. So although the platform or the foundation is very Eurocentric, um, sometimes you need those foundations um, because there are, there's no other build, there's, there are no other building blocks to then set your design upon. Um, but it doesn't mean that what we produce has to look that way. Um, and for me, it's all about bringing your uniqueness, um, expressing who we are, um, what we want to be, and also what we want to become. Because at the end of the day, that's how we're going to bring this new richness. And um, did you have a second part to that question? I don't remember. Was, it, was there a second part to that question? Uh, yes, the second parts of the question are, uh, what do we need to truly see change, not only in the classroom? Oh, but the right, okay. Well, that really comes down to um, leadership. Um, that's the only way. At OCAD University, um, we are setting about decolonizing the curriculum. And Dean Doris Tunstall, I'm gonna give her a shout out. And also I'm gonna big up Lillian Allen, who is a professor at OCAD. Um, originally from Jamaica, um, educated in North America. She fought for years um, for a more diverse faculty. And, uh, and now it's actually happening. And so what, what basically happens there is we've got um, what we call a cluster hire. So just hiring one black professor or one BIPOC professor is not going to make the change. So we have to look at this cluster because it really comes down to, um, what would you just call it? You call it crit critical mass, right? So if you have that critical mass, you can actually make the impact. And I noticed that after we had our black cluster higher, of which I was part of that, so I'm very honored. Um, I think it was the Rhode Island School of Design has mm -hmm. just hired 10 um, black designers as well. So if you have that critical mass, you can actually move forward. Um, and then I would say in the classroom, and if there are any white professors listening, um, which I'm sure there are, there are hundreds, um, it really starts off with some very basic things that you can actually do. It's not rocket science, right? It just takes some doing um, and action is, you know, do a little bit of research on, on black designers. You know, Google is there for everybody. Um, look for, um, you know, Google black artists, uh, Instagram, you know, um, uh, was it African digital art? Instagram, uh, Afrotopia. So you can get, you can get this information. It's, it's the willingness. Are you willing to do that to make that change? Um, even revision path. So I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna give a shout out to Maurice. An, an excellent uh, podcast which you could play or you can set as a as a something with, that your students can do. Um, but also educating the institution as well. And I'll, and I'll say one other thing so you guys can get a sense of um, where I'm coming from. So I grew up in the UK, I was born there. And in England, we were taught that um, black people had no writing systems. Okay, well, that's what we were taught in school. And I remember thinking, sitting in that classroom thinking, well, that can't be right. That can't be right. So I went home and I told my and I told my dad and I'm and I'm like oh like this is what they've said at school and in a truly Jamaican way he says make them one man I lie them I tell right so so it was like no okay so my dad has said it's a lie so it, it is a lie right and uh, and so for me it's like I'm seeking out you know African typography you know it's it's beautiful if you haven't kind of delve into that it's fantastic 
uh, and bringing those kind of things to the classroom. So that would be my my answer to that. Um, yeah, I, I want to add. OK, yes, I, I, I said I don't teach the canon. Um, and I, I want to add a little bit of like theoretical grounding then to it, um, my not teaching to the canon. Um, because I'm not teaching like aesthetics and, you know, I'm really teaching about process, you know, I'm in community engaged design. Uh, I am grounding um, a lot of what I'm doing now in decolonial um, literature and also trying to get people to really think about their positionality. And, you know, we talk about race all the time. Um, and, you know, like I, I did a focus group with black students um, at one point and I really felt, uh, and, and this is something that I think maybe a lot of other professors would feel. Sometimes you, you there's a guilt that we also feel as black professors, you know, after I did this focus group and I felt that as a black professor, I had been feeling them because maybe I wasn't making my class um, if I'm teaching the same thing that everybody else is teaching, you know, some of these classes are not friendly to black students, you know, and now if we're thinking of change, that's one of the things that I'm thinking about, you know, how do I make my class accountable to black um, students, or we have black community partners, you know, how do I make the work that we are doing um, really be able to stand up to um, what the demands of the, the bike park community are, you know, how are we making work that serves our community well, um, which might then be like a different kind of conversation that we're having in the design class. You know, um, we are talking, like I said, about race all of the time and maybe a little bit too much for some people, but I think, you know, if people see race, um, and have the skills to talk about it, then I, as a professor, think that I've done my part. Thank you, guys. I think you guys um, put up some amazing points. The next question I have is, being a Black professor at a predominantly white institution is, it can be increasingly uncomfortable given the weight of cultural taxation that you experience in comparison to your white colleagues. Could you guys speak to that experience and what it may be like for a student of color at a predominantly white institution as far as cultural taxation and that discomfort is concerned? Uh, so I, I think on, on two levels, you know, as a professor, uh, you know, I just mentioned the guilt that I was made to feel or that I felt, not that I was made to feel, um, where on more than one occasion, I have had to think, okay, am I doing enough for black students? And I don't know if other, um, I don't know if white professors are thinking about that. Are they doing enough for white, um, students? And so it means then, you know, as a professional, um, at a predominantly white institution. I'm dealing then with um, some, some kinds of microaggressions that may be unintentional, but you know, like I was in a conversation recently where I had to kind of casually drop things like, okay, yes, and I have a PhD in design and I teach at Stanford and NC State and Tulane, and you mean this is not enough information? You know, so, so sometimes we're dealing with those levels of microaggressions as well as having to think um, about how we are supporting, um, you, you know, I think that my service level or what is expected of me is huge, you know, I was mentoring students all summer um, because students see a professor who looks like them and reach out. And of course I want to support them, but I think that, that there's that kind of um, very big workload for black professors. And I don't know if there are, um, if they're really the support system that, that exist um, or even the recognition or acknowledgement of the amount of work that we do. And I'll stop there for a bit. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Um, I'm going to jump in here. Um, so for me, I think um, I was the only Black person hired um, in the you know the area of graphic design um, where I previously taught for four years, 
And then I'm coming into a new university where I'm still the only black faculty member in graphic design. And so, um, you know, I don't think I, I ever conquer or, or there's no like secret recipe to conquer the feeling of feeling like an other or feeling uncomfortable. Just like Les, you just mentioned the microaggressions alone, like just make you not want to show up to work. Um, and because of that, anytime I see a black student or a black employee at my institution, you know, I make sure like I run and grab like their information and <laughs> let them know like, hey, I'm here, you're here, like, can we, you know, set up some time to like have, you know, space, right? Um, and that's a symptom of racism, like that scarcity, you know, that we even exist and we can exist in, in those institutions is like completely wrong, right? Um, to me personally, when I, when I think about that, I, I think about how our institutions are really kind of going at um, diversity, equity, and inclusion work backwards. Like, I feel like, um, you know, this fight for equity, this diversity, and this representation that they're wanting, um, rather than focusing on the Black people that are already there and existing in their institutions, they're like, let's just get like more people into a more like dangerous environment. And like, they think that's really going to like help. And, you know, my thought is like, you know, as, as a black culture, like we talk, you know? So like if the place is good and we feel like we belong and we have a voice and we don't have to constantly prove our credentials to people, like we're gonna tell other people and black people are gonna try and get into those same spaces. So like, I feel like that whole conversation, like about this whole like diversity and we need more representation, that's gonna make it better. That's not what's gonna make it better. And you like, again, I feel like you never get over that. Um, and sometimes when I hear them talking, them talking about like you know how how we can you know help solve these problems i hear things like you know it's, it starts with the with the next generation we need to get to the k to the k through 12 schools and, and all of that and while yes that needs to be happening simultaneously it's almost like i feel like i'm a race and my experience is a race because i'm not in that in that you know k through 12 generation and yet they're not like trying to fix any of the systemically racist you know policies and practices that are happening every day in those institutions so you know it's like they're forgetting the folks who are who are already here you know who continue to suffer suffer every day Day, um, in these systems due to the culture of white supremacy that is so prevalent within our institutions. Um, and then let's not forget like the cultural taxation of being like the trainer or the racist problem solver solely due to the fact that you're black. Um, and even in the in the classroom as a black student, you're oftentimes called, about, called upon to talk about blackness and teach your white you know, um, colleagues or your white um, uh, uh, counterparts uh, about racism and anti-blackness. And that, you know, isn't isn't right either. Those are all symptoms of racism. And if we had a true culture where like I as a black professor, I'm not the only one in my program talking about racism, it would be much easier for us to be able to move forward. I like that. I could just add to that. Um, I, I come from a very similar situation. I've taught for 12 years and at both of those institutions, I was the only black faculty member and I found myself trying to connect to these one or two black students I'd find every now and then, which, you know, is <laughs> probably good, but I also feel a little bit awkward because I'm giving them a lot of extra attention because it's like, oh my God, you're here. Um, so I, I definitely felt that uh, there was a distinction between um, what I wanted to be feeling and then the work I was trying to do at the same time, making this space more inclusive and um, also trying to be, it's a lot, it really is. And you don't even recognize that it's a lot sometimes until um, it's much later when you've given a lot of that energy for years and years. And you're just like, yeah, there's, there's just something that's a little off. You know, my colleagues weren't necessarily um, direct about acknowledging those differences or making sure that I was trying to be that representation or whatever. But when you're the only one and the fa the staff is, or the, the faculty is, you know, 10 to 15 people, you know, who else is gonna do it? And yeah, it's it's a difficult crux to be in. <laughs> and, and you have this extra workload um, that is not actually going to be evaluated. And I think to me, that's that's the challenge because actually the institution needs you to do that extra work. Um, but then you need to be uh, recognized and rewarded for it. You know, if you are in a tenure track position, nobody afterwards is supposed to say, oh, well, you were doing the wrong, you were focusing on the wrong thing. You were focusing on the right thing, but it wasn't being evaluated. Mm -hmm. 
that right there. Um, so uh, <laughs> jumping to the next question, uh, universities are attempting to push diversity and inclusion um, as a means to solve the racial divide. Uh, this performative allyship can harm uh, the state of Black design and education. What do you see are some of the issues with approaches, um, whether with your institution or other institutions, and what can we do to, to, to be better um, in, 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 in addressing um, this, this issue? Yeah, so I'll jump in here. So um, not only am I an assistant professor of graphic design, but I'm the new director of design justice at the University of Minnesota. And uh, one of the things that I find, probably one of the most frustrating things I find within the academic world is the use of language. Um, I feel like there is an almost toxic relationship with language in academia. Um, like language can be weaponized against folks without power. It, it's like part of this political bureaucracy that like stops policy from being passed or, um, you know, folks claim tradition in language like as a means to like say, oh, I'm not going to identify someone in the way they want to be identified because this is how we're supposed to do it right. Um, and so I feel like the relationship with language is um, used as a performative tool as well. So I feel like language overall is like can be harmful. Um, I think it's used to publicize that an institution stands for something that in action it actually does not. Um, like the land acknowledgements or the diversity statements that like people are throwing in their syllabus but don't actually do anything within their class to emphasize those things. Um, and so those statements, that language is never supported by real action account and accountability. Um, I feel like those uh, claims are almost um, the, the language used in those claims is almost as, uh, more harmful than the actual racism within our institutions because it perpetuates the idea that we are something that we are not and that there's no need for change. Um, so we'd rather say we're striving for diversity than say we have a foundation and a core of white supremacy within our institution. Um, I think the uncovering of those truths um, is uncomfortable, it hurts, um, but that is necessary for real change. And I said um, in an apartment meeting just today that I feel like white folks are more afraid of being called racist than black people who are dying at the hands of systemic racism. Um, and that fear, you know, that I'm gonna say something offensive so I don't even wanna do anything, that stops people and our institutions and our communities from actually moving forward and actually um, doing something that's going to um, bring healing um, and liberation to our community. So the thing I find most interesting about all of this is that as an institution of higher education, we should be at the forefront of innovative and creative ways to approach racialized design, abolishing the systems of oppression, reimagining new design approaches um, that challenge our institutions to move forward um, toward not just equity, but liberation for black lives. That was beautiful, Terry. I I know I'm supposed to add something to this, but honestly, um, you you've said so many impactful things. I I have some experience in this, um, having served on my universities or my colleges um, design. No, sorry, it's the uh, diversity and equity and inclusion team. Something it went through a few different names over the years, and the the goal of that organization was to infuse our college with opportunities for education, assistance um, for this broadly defined group of diverse people. So we were looking at um, the LGBTQ community, um, people of color, um, we're looking at veterans, people with disabilities and so forth. And so we did a lot of wonderful things through that group by making things accessible to people. We um, had a program where students could have their fees for a passport waived if they wanted to travel abroad and study uh, and that was a barrier for them, which it oftentimes is for people of color and so forth. Um, so we did some really wonderful things through that group, but a lot of what we did was sort of based in academia, which isn't always attractive to the people we're trying to include and communicate with. Um, again, you pair that with the dearth of representation on such a team, even though we actually managed to get a bit more than we normally would have at that college. Um, and, it, and it just sort of feels like a committee that sits around and talks about um, why aren't there more black people, why aren't there more gay people and so forth, when really we should be asking the questions that Terry just mentioned. Um, so I, I enjoyed being on those committees and I enjoyed the work that we did do and the impact that we had. But ultimately um, we were limited just like what was being said earlier about the safe spaces and so forth. Um, we can only go so far up the chain before it's, you know, it's like, okay, y'all had your fun. Um, we we got the recognition from the outside world that we need. Now calm down, <laughs> you know. 
Yeah. Yeah. And if, and if I can chime in, you know, just the whole conversation of, you know, being black and disabled and, and making sure that students, you know, in, in the time of COVID, like professors making sure that they are just empathetic, creating virtual safe spaces, like what do those spaces look like, you know, talking making sure that those students who were begging for accessibility needs and begging for accommodations, you know, being black and disabled, like they have so much, so much already stacked up against them. Um, and so making sure that the virtual space is a space where they feel, okay, like I'm heard, this is like an experimental way of learning for me, or maybe they would have preferred learning that way to begin with, because it's just a little bit more you know, it's one on one, we can do like virtual appointments. And maybe sometimes the classrooms themselves were these like oppressive spaces where they felt like they were competing with so many folks just to get a word in. Um, so I think that, you know, we can't talk about diversity and inclusion if we're not talking about the students who need those accommodations, the students who have been fighting for those accommodations who don't even have spaces to assemble on campus because of you know of the, the way that the spaces are just designed you know they're they're not really meant for those those particular voices you know students who have learning disabilities students who who are autistic who feel like i can't even get a word in because you know uh i don't necessarily feel like i'm worthy of being seen like i'm i'm, I'm i feel disposable um so i think we just need to continue to just make sure that those students are uplifted um, and that they feel like they're just, that they have the accommodations. Thank you. Um, now more than ever, it's necessary for Black voices to be at the table, as we mentioned in our first and second panel. Um, how do we get more Black voices and talent into design education, both in the classroom and both from you know, the faculty standpoint? How do you guys see that? Um, how, what do you guys think we should do to kind of, of um, better diversify our classrooms? Well, I, I could jump in here. I think my microphone is on. Yes, I can jump in here. Um, I, I, can, I can only speak for OCAD, of, OCAD University, of course. So part of our mandate as being part of that Black Cluster Hire is to actually get out into the community. And I think it was Owen, I think earlier on, or it may have been Sam, I think, talked about, um, you know, tr tr untraditional routes into design education. Um, but also um, there's some projects that uh, Dean Dory has spearheaded primarily for Black youth. And one of those is the, uh, uh, blackocad.ca and it's the Black Youth Design Initiative and so going into the community which is what we, we have to do and, and something I love doing as well um, and having these programs introducing kids to design to let them, make, let them play and let, let them express themselves. Um, we, there are summer, summer initiatives that we have, there's a portfolio um, course that we have for black students as well if they want to get into higher education where they can work with mentors. Um, we have there's an entrepreneurship program for black youth. So I think it really starts, you know, from that ground up. And I think Teresa, you said that um, I'm, just, just, I'm just trying to think back to the point that you made um, that it's all about, oh, it's the next generation. And if you think about it, we were the next generation, right? And here we are today. Uh, in the 21st century talking about the same thing. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, it's not just going to happen in the classroom, like it has to be brought out into the community as well. And, um, and if you're going to bring them into the institution, then that institution has to be safe. So it sort of comes back to what we were talking about before. So it's not a point of us going out into the community saying, hey, you know, doing graphic design is so cool and it's great and let's express yourself. And then we put them into these institutions and they experience um, something that, you know, we don't, we don't want them to experience, which is a, um, a negative um, episode in their life. But at OCAD, we really are trying to make the space itself safe. Um, we've heard from our black students, we know what the problems are. And we, with, with the, with the uh, critical mass that we have, we can push for that change and make those safe places and safe spaces for our students. Yeah, 
and and if I can chime in, are, are we still on that question? Is that the last question in our panel? Okay. So, and thank you for that, Angela. And so just kind of from, from where you were coming from in terms of like safe spaces. So safe as in spaces that like where students who are different, um, who have various identities, especially students who are disabled, um, do they feel like that they can come as their true authentic selves? And that's something that I've heard so much tonight and that I just love that it's been a part of everyone's vernacular. Um, coming as their true authentic selves in terms of not masking and feeling like if I have a disability, am I gonna have am I gonna be forced to conform as like a black or BIPOC disabled student? As a black, you know, BIPOC disabled professor, like will I feel like I have to conform or mask on my campus to just be respected among the students and e even among like the, the other faculty. So I feel like um, you know, as we continue having the these conversations like about authenticity and about making sure we feel safe is like, but if, if I was born a specific way or if I acquired a disability late in life, is that gonna shift the way that, 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 that I appear, the way that, that, that I can be amplified? Like just in society in general, um, knowing that the curriculum, knowing that the, the courses, knowing that the way that, that, that they feel on campus is always being used against them or being used as, or, or just being used as a space where they don't necessarily feel advocated for. Um, because, you know, how many of you have students in your class that need consistent accommodations and can say that you're familiar with that process and what it takes to get, you know, what, what the accommodation process is like, and if they feel like they can come to you specifically to feel uplifted and, and amplified, not just from you, but just from like their classroom in general, from like the students that they engage with on a consistent basis. Because if it's not necessarily starting with their art education, if we're not inspiring them to be authentic, to be um, to be vulnerable with the way that they even approach their their projects, then uh, we're we're pretty much like just setting them up for like the systemic aspect of non or, or just of, of compliance, you know. Um, so that's just like a huge issue, and I feel like we don't really talk about it enough. We don't really professors don't even talk about it enough. We we spend a lot of time not necessarily wanting to feel like we have our own disabilities and we, can, we necessarily can't share that with our students. Um, and it's just gonna continue to be a, a very oppressive space um, if we're talking about diversifying the workforce, but we have to, you know, we have to get rid of that, of that inward oppression um, where we can't even really be like us, you know, our true selves. I, I, I could jump in here again and, and um, I want to echo what Jacinda said um, earlier on about just doing it yourself. So I, I also have my own design company and I've been working for myself for the past 30 years, having my own company. And, and again, I think it may have been Sam talked about different routes of getting into the design industry. Well, we don't actually all have to go to college. Um, you know, I had a black youth training program in my company um, brought in designers, some of these kids didn't even graduate high school, they would never get into those institutions, but bringing them in and training them and teaching them, it gives them a route into the industry. Um, and so I think the other part of it is, do we have to go through these channels? I've also trained ex-female convicts in graphic design, right? And they've gone on to change their life and get into the design industry. Would they be able to do that? In a, you know, and get to college and do that in a normal route? No. Um, so I agree with Jacinda and I'm gonna to have to talk to her um, after the panel discussion is over. <laughs> Larry, would you like to add on to that too? Um, yes, I, I definitely, um, I, I wanted to touch on the, um, the point that Jennifer made about being yourself because i feel that a lot of what i do even in the classroom but certainly outside of it is encouraging the students to just seek out exactly what the thing is that will make them happy and if that's through design or through being creative in some way um that there can be a path for them because i like to think of myself as proof that that's possible i'm a first generation college student um first generation a lot of stuff because I just sort of sought out those opportunities because I you know, I don't know why, but I, I try to use myself as an example for those sorts of successes. And more than more important than it is for me to be 
for them to be students of mine in graphic design or be at this university, it's important for them to be successful black people who don't have their dreams crushed by the weight of our history. And so a lot of times what I'm doing as an instructor or what I was doing as an instructor is fielding students into or funneling them into where they belong that might not even be with me as their instructor. Um, but I think that we have to give students the space to explore their options that doesn't always depend on college and university experience um, because we all know that that's a costly um, barrier for a lot of people. My university or my college requires that a student who comes in has a brand new computer so that they can do the work that we do. That makes sense for a white person who has a history with family who's gone to college, you know, that sort of thing. For me, I remember thinking a computer is the farthest thing from possible for me. And so that would have instantly been a barrier for someone like me if I hadn't had help, you know, from people in the community and so forth. That diversity isn't going to just happen when we invite people in because we have to show them a version of success that could happen based on their circumstances. So that's that's been my personal goal, I think. That's beautiful. Yeah, and I, and I feel like they, like they um I feel like I'm just learning from listening to you and knowing that like I can just be be me and and that's just the goal is just, you know, something that I dropped in the chat and I've been taking notes as we've been talking is just letting students know um, that that their lived experiences and identities can like embolden like their creative thinking and process, you know, like, like th that their lived experience, like just like you were saying, like their true identities can really help set the tone um, for just feeling like they can just exist as as their true authentic selves and that there's there's power and that there's resistance in that existence. I know that's kind of corny, but, you know, I mean, just making sure that um but but we have to set that tone and i'm glad that that everybody is is in alignment with that and i just want to see more i just want to see more amplification of differences um difference is in you know in in the way that that we live in the way that that we that we were born with you know um you know i i just want to continue to see that so yeah um as a young black academic uh I agree with the idea that there are not many of us and also want to take the time to um, acknowledge the inspiration and motivation that I get from seeing, you know, professors such as yourselves um, in our private discussions, uh, both about the private work and research that you guys do, as well as my experiences with some of you, Larry, um, in a physical classroom setting. Um, you know, I've, I've gleaned a lot. Um, Jennifer, definitely um, from your passion and the advocacy that you do for the disabled populace. Uh, Terry, um, the, the work that you do with Black Bird Revolt, um, and Angela, the, the work, the breadth of work that you do and the, the talks that you've had, I've, I've taken a lot from. And Larry, you know, you've, the assistance that you provided me um, as an aspiring professor uh, during my time at Kent, as well as some of the other faculty members there. So as a young um, faculty member who looks um, up to you guys in a lot of different ways, I, I again want to thank you guys for taking the time to be on this panel and acknowledge the work that you guys have done because without people like you um, going out there and doing the work that you do, I probably wouldn't be a professor myself. Omari, if I could just say real quick, Mm -hmm. I, I, I absolutely appreciate what you just said. And I want to say to you that you sort of got me started on this whole journey of looking deeper at the racial divide that has always been around me because you came to me with your questions for your thesis and you just, I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that I was helpful to you, but honestly, you started me thinking about a lot of things. And, and so to be part of this right now is, that's all on you. And, and I think that what you're doing is absolutely wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, yeah. sir. And Larry, I think I'm going to tag on to what you just said and say, well, Omari also does a little bit of reverse mentorship um, where um, I am very inspired by, you know, like what Omari has written and then that he would take on this, this huge project and, and just bring it off. We had how many ever thousands of people registered. Um, so, you know, you're also pretty inspiring to all of us. No, I appreciate it. I'm uh, I'm still trying to get my schedule muscle to match yours. Like, I, I still don't know how you squeeze all the, all the projects that you do, Leslie, into like one thing, but you guys, I think you guys are awesome. And, and I thank you again. Um, 
I'm going to jump into the next panel, um, design as activism. So with this panel, uh, we are going to conclude, um, but this panel is going to discuss the recent uprising since the murder of George Floyd, Rihanna Taylor, Tony McDade, and many others. This panel will discuss the roots of protests in the field of design and how designers of color have used their creative ability to advocate for safety, equity, and liberation. So with my honor, I will introduce again, uh, Teresa Moses, uh, pronouns she and her, creative director at Blackbird Revolt. Jordan Moses, pronouns he, him, visionary director at Blackbird Revolt. Lauren Williams, pronouns she, her, designer, researcher, organizer, and Antoinette Carroll, pronouns she, her, founder, president, and CEO at Creative Reaction Lab, and co-founder and co-director at and design. Sorry. All right. So the very first question I would like to ask, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement and recent uprising since the murder of George Floyd, what opportunities have presented themselves, good and bad, um, for designers of color, and what kind of opportunities does this present to Black designers? So I, I'm happy to jump in. Thanks again for having me, Omari. Um, of course. So I think one, one thing that I've noticed is that it feels like an opportunity that's clearly presented itself to folks, whether uh, Black, people of color, Indigenous or not, who do design work. Um, is these moments or attempts to kind of acknowledge or contribute to the movement in ways that are designed or designed interventions. So I'm talking about like Black Lives Matter murals that have cropped up in many cities. Um, some of this is extended to other kind of actions that take over space or use art and design to kind of um, signal solidarity or allyship, um, social media campaigns, things like that, like the blackout that happened earlier in the summer. Um, and, and I think for me, I, I think they're important. They are an important part of, of what's going on, but they're also completely inadequate and, and extremely performative in a way that I think sort of obscures the larger question that's at hand when people are making demands, at least in this particular moment, when the demand is um, make Black Lives Matter, which re requires in that demand to do, to do things like defund police um, treat people differently, fundamentally change the way that we regard Black life. Um, and so for me, that's it. it's become really present that that seems to be an opportunity that folks have taken advantage of in many, many, many cities across the country right now. But I'm more interested instead, um, I live in Detroit, and, and I think, you know, in these basic ways that designers can be involved in making demands that would make li Black Lives Matter, like turning water on instead of off in the middle of a pandemic, for example, um, which is something that's still happening in Detroit, or ending uh, evictions or putting moratoriums on evictions, which are still happening in the middle of a pandemic in cities like Detroit. So I'm interested in that. Um, I think I'm interested in the potential of Black designers to kind of commit ourselves to organizing and being being residents and neighbors and not bringing design to the conversation first, because I think we presume that it can solve a lot of problems that it really can't. Um, so those are some of the things I'm interested in. I have a much longer list, but I'd love to hear what other folks have in mind. So I'll jump in um, after you. Thank you for your insight, um, Lauren. So um, when I think about this question, I think I'm first like saddened um, by the fact that it takes the murder and killing of Black people um, to open doors for us. Um, I think that, you know, in the world that we live in that's, you know, founded on white supremacy, it takes white shame and guilt um, for access to resources for the Black community. Um, and frankly, I'm angry about it. Um, uh, sad and angry. And uh, with each moment that happens each time, um, you know, someone is taken from us, uh, from our community, I I hope that momentum will continue. And so while you know there is much much heartbreak, there is new traumatizations there um, that develop for us, and there's so much more that we have to overcome. I I do I think that you have to be just a little bit of hopeful, a little hopeful. And I think I'm hopeful because um, there are so many beautifully talented and creative Black folks whose work does need to be brought to the forefront. I think that this presents an opportunity for that beautiful and that creative work um, to truly center Black joy and liberation. 
Um, you know, we're always been a resilient people. And I think that, you know, for that to come to the to the forefront is some is an opportunity um, in the midst of all of this chaos and all of the traumas that we're um, re that are happening to us again. I think that we have an opportunity to create and design um, completely new systems that center um, all all black people, um, just emphasizing that point, Jennifer, uh, from the last panel, all black people, black disabled people, black queer people, it has the, we ha it has the opportunity to do that, to imagine new ways of governance, um, to imagine new forms of education, to imagine new ways of food access, to imagine new ways of accessible structures, new forms of collective leadership. Um, we have the ability to do that as designers. We don't have to come in there and say, hey, we're going to make a logo, but we can actually use um, design and the way that we think about things to be able to move some of those things forward. I think that now is the time for us to use our abilities as a resilient and creative people to bring those ideas to fruition. Um, I totally agree with you when I think we need to be organizers. Um, I am an organizer, I'm an activist, and um, Black Bear Revolt is here in St. Paul, um, Minnesota. And so we're here, you know, and I think um, we already have the minds and the ability to do that. And I think we just need to do it. Um, when we talk about representation, I said this at uh, a talk that I gave at Antoinette's uh, um, conference, you know, I, when I talk about representation, I want to just represent. I want representation by people who want to represent. So bringing in all of our true and full blackness um, now, I think it presents a time where you know we're not going to be shunned for that, where we can actually do that and find support within our communities and our accomplices to be able to move things forward. I also want to add to that if I can, Amari, if you're fine with that. Of okay. course. Cool. Uh, hi everyone. I'm excited to see everyone. I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling love here today. Um, and y'all are bringing me so much joy in a day that has been a lot. If I'm going to be fully transparent, um, you know, when I think about this question, one of the things I reflect on is that Black Lives Matter before it became a hashtag, and it's going to matter before it, the, you know, after the media is gone. And I think there has been. Um, this tendency to try to only focus on what's happening right now in this moment, and also forgetting that there have been ancestors and people on the ground that have been doing this work in the creative field and not for decades, <laughs> right, and for generations. And so when I think about what role design plays in this moment, one, we need to make sure that we are thinking about how we define design, which you all have, anyone that's ever heard me talk, you know, I'm always trying to blow out the definition of design uh, because I've seen spaces where people say design can't change the world, which excuse my language is fucking bullshit because design has created the world. Design literally was the invisible innovation before innovation became a word. You know, every, all systems have been by design, including our oppressive systems. And so our designers, which includes everyone here and everyone in the world, need to think about how do I design beyond my ivory tower? How do I make sure that I am not centering my design as just a form of working within my computer, but also thinking about how am I becoming a system designer within my own community? And so I really wanna push us to move beyond just what's happening in this moment. And I'm not going to shame people that's showing up now because everyone has had that moment in their life where that was the pivotal piece for them. That was the catalyst for change. And so for the folks that are showing up because of the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Tony day you know we welcome you and don't just do this as a performative act but make it your life journey and if you are only here to do a poster campaign this is not the work for you because this work is hard it is messy and it is something that requires us to show up authentically as ourselves and so if you are here to just put something on your resume or on your portfolio site i'm gonna need you to go ahead and take that somewhere else and so I just want to just want to be very frank in this space in saying that design has always been powerful, but one of the things we need to really think about is that many folks on the other side, and I hate to put a line here, but many folks on the other side have thought about how to use design to uphold oppressive colonization system, white supremacy systems for decades. And so we need to think about how we're going to use the design to actually build a space of equity and liberation and of joy and honestly of legacy. Um, yeah, um, all right. So, all right, the way, uh, <laughs> I appreciate, I appreciate all of you guys and, and that, that, that comment. I, I mean, and, and yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm loving this. All right. So the way to, the way to solve racism within our community has always been on the backs of black people. 
Um, how can we begin to shift the responsibility and in what ways can design support this shift? Yeah, I'll, I'll hop in here. So, I mean, the impacts of, of, of racism are quite real and obviously need to be dealt with. I mean, the lack of access, the opportunity, I mean, it's systemic, right? It's, it's, it's orchestrated. Antoinette was just saying they, they were designed. These things are designed, right? There's people on the other side figuring out how to design systems and design culture, design practices to subjugate people, to harm people, right? And, you know, we are often forced to carry uh, or deal with the side effects of of racism and the dehumanizing circumstances that, that we're faced with, right? These systems that we live within and under weren't set up for our health and well being. They're not set up for the health and well being of Black people, right? Their foundations are more often than not rooted in our subjugation. And in, in my eyes, many of the systems, say for instance, police are in direct conflict with black health, black safety and joy, right? Many of these systems can't change or shift to accommodate our needs. So I don't really believe it's our responsibility to shift or change or reform these systems, um, especially when usually if you look at how black folks throw their money and time and energy and especially our votes, we're the ones consistently trying to stop the system from destroying all folks. Um, and, you know, but I, I also believe that it is our job and we, we're tasked with knowing how to navigate the systems, right, for survival. Um, but it's our job to really spend our energy and leverage our brilliance to build something vastly different. Like our job is not to carry the systems that exclude us. Our job is to build space, systems, communities that center the love, health, creativity, visions, and joy of Black peoples. That is our job, right? And I think design can support this by helping shape the visions and creating those realities, right? Antoinette's saying this stuff is designed, so we design it. Right. And if we're all designers, we design that future. We design the systems, the culture, the practices that we engage in. Right. And that feed us and that heal us and design and our language and our messaging and our communication can highlight what can be and what will be. So we can disseminate information. We can articulate ideas and we can really share our visions through design. So I will be very honest, this question brings up a major tension for me because we did not create the system of racism. And I'm going to be very, very honest. I don't personally want a white person to come and tell me how they're going to fix the system that impacts me without centering my voice. You can't tell me what it's like to be a black woman. You can't tell me what it's like to be a black mother. You can't tell me what it's like to be a black wife and also have to look at the reality of the black men in my family have died significantly early, including my 14 year old brother from two years ago. You know, you cannot sit here and, and what I think, and this is the tension I'm having is because, you know, you have individuals that will come in with this white savior complexity and say, I'm going to help when many times it's them centering their ego and trying to be empathy, you know, warriors, opposed to actually looking at how has my biases, have my privileges, have my, you know, unseen areas actually continually created harm. And so there tends to be this movement of, I want to help without actually helping with through a lens of accountability. And when I think about this, you know, actually us dismantling these systems of racism, which we know intersects with so many phobias and intersects with so many other isms. And many times we try to divide it as if it's this one bucket, like it doesn't intersect in all these other areas. You know, I do believe that it has to be a combination of both. You know, in, in my work, we talk about building a movement of redesigners for justice and recognizing that we need folks that have the living expertise to be a part of the work. and as stated many times, we pay for their, <laughs> their, service, their time, but then also the folks that, you know, have the power and privileges and be able to leverage those power and privileges on behalf of others. And in some cases, you know, I'm not saying that black folks don't have power and privileges in spaces because again, when you look at the intersectionality, sometimes we do. And we really need to look at when should I be centered and when should I maybe bring others along and provide them with the space and the safety and the ability to be brave and also the ability to hold others accountable. 
Uh, but some of that is also having to look at the reality that we have drunk from the same faucet and narratives as everyone else. And one of the two of the greatest tools that have been used is kind of upholding ignorance and upholding division. You know, there has been intentionality of erasure of narratives of black folks and the intentionality of race, uh, erasure of just our lack of racial consciousness where many times it's hard for us to even step up and understand how these systems are, are, have been designed to affect us because we're not even taught what they are. It took for me to learn later on in my life all these different things, such as school to confinement pipeline, that I was a product of, my family very much was a product of, for me to feel like that I actually can challenge the system. And so I do feel like there, I don't think it should be fully the responsibility of Black people to dismantle racism in entirety, because again, we didn't create it. And also don't exclude my voice and my power when it comes to actually getting rid of that system, because ultimately what's going to happen is that those individuals would then replace the system that ultimately benefits them. And again, I'm still in an oppressive state. Thank you so much. Um, one question I do wanna ask, um, that I didn't put on the list prior, but I, considering that this panel is about design as activism and considering that you guys are each very active um, design activists, design citizens, I, I want to ask about um, the types of organizing that you guys are doing and the advice that you would give to other people who are looking to organize in their own cities. Um, Terry and Jordan, I know uh, with Blackbird Revolts, um, you guys have done a lot of organizing since the murder of George Floyd in your respective uh, city. That's well, not too far from where you guys are. And Lauren, I know that you mentioned, you know, recent things that have been happening in Detroit and, and the activism that you guys have been doing. And Antoinette, you know, you've mentioned a, a swath of, 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 of activity that you've created. If I, as a designer, or I, as a creative who has not jumped into industry yet, or may still be a student or on my way to becoming a, a collegiate student, what advice would you give me? And, and how can I start also utilizing my abilities um, to assist others? Um, if I could jump in, I get this question a lot from students who like will see the work that I do and they're like, I want to do social justice like design, like how do I do that? Um, I would tell, I, my advice is really to lead with the issue first. Um, you know, so whatever thing you're advocating for, find organizations that are doing that, gain experience, understand the issues from those people, from folks who have been doing the work like Antoinette said, um, and then you can bring your design stuff on the side, but you actually do have to get your hands dirty and actually organize. And that's one thing that Blackboard Revolt does is that we're not just like, oh yeah, you know, we're reaching out to you so we can make the poster for your next protest. No, we over here on the organizing call two or three times a week trying to get the thing organized. And so like, I think that um, like, I wanna just like bring out that point that Antoinette was saying is like, you know, we're not trying to do a logo for something or, or a poster. Yeah, that helps when we're trying to get the message out there, but or the organizing part has happened, happened long before we even come to the table and say, here's what the new whatever looks like. Um, so I think I would lead with issue first, even when you're thinking about an organi um, um, industry jobs that you wanna go to, lead with the issue first. What's go who's gonna have the most equitable place for you to thrive, you know? So I think issue first, and then you know all your other, your talents are secondary to what you've been advocating for. I, I would just second that because I think there's a lot of times that I've watched designers uh, presume, presume expertise because of what we know about design and kind of like think that it can apply to any problem because we are problem solvers, right? Which I, I don't really say that about myself, but that's, that's, a, that's a thing that designers say. Um, and so I think, I think with that in mind, I would, I would say just like remove that veil and, and show up in places where um, you care about people, show up with your neighbors, show up um, when you, like like Terry just said, like show up to the issue and to the place and to the people that you're committed to. Um, somebody's gonna find you and be like, I need a flyer, <laughs> don't worry, it will come. Um, that's not the point though. And I think, I think um, for me, that's how I've shown up in most of the spaces that I've been a part of, specifically in Detroit, uh, but also as, like, as a student, I did organizing work 
um, around anti-racism and pedagogy and things like that. And at the same time, even though it was in a design context, it was in the context of a private white supremacist elite institution called Art Center College of Design. Um, it was not um, because of design, it was just the, because of the condition of where we were and, and the issues that were, were being presented to us. And so there were times at which we would leverage what we knew about making things or facilitating or um, critique through design, but it was, it was never the point. It was just a, a, a way that we knew how to work. And I think for me, that's how I've always come to design because I came to design late. I got my MFA. I didn't study design as an undergrad. I studied policy and I worked in economic policy for a while. So for me, I come to design interested in the, the capacity it has to intervene in, in the social problems that I'm concerned with around racism and oppression and um, capitalism and things like that. So just I would emphasize everything Terry said, don't start with your stellar you know, type design skills, <laughs> they will come in handy later, right? Um, but the issue is kind of what has to be the crux of why, why you're showing up and how you're showing up. I, I just wanna add to that. Uh, honestly, the people on the ground don't care about your kerning skills. They really don't. <laughs> I know that's a big deal. Don't get me wrong, I'm an alignment person, but they don't really care. <laughs> you know, when you look at the impactful movements in science that we're seeing on the ground, they're handmade, they're authentic. And I think what's important and what should be highlighted from that is that they center their purpose. And so the, the feedback I would give is really think about what's, what's my purpose and what am I actually working towards that's important for me and my family. Because I stated earlier that this work is hard. And if you are just trying to show up in someone else's space and don't actually have a connection to it, and you don't have an authentic reason on really thinking about not only what can I learn, but what can I unlearn? Um, then you need to probably take a lar larger look at what you're actually doing. Um, I also would recommend doing the work and not just doing the work, doing the work on yourself because we have all contributed to harm. You know, we have all also been navigating generational trauma. And so that it requires really reflecting on how is that showing up with me? Um, and does that require me to also, in many cases, ask others to lead through the lens of conformity or whatever it may be that we, we learned and actually trying to shatter that at the same time. So even in my organization, when we have monthly staff meetings, we always set aside a time of pair discussion on what did I begin to unlearn last month? Because we know that that work needs to continue uh, as it goes on. Um, I also, the last thing, I don't know if it's the last thing I will say, but many times we need to think about how do we build trust with the community? And uh, there's an organizer on the ground in St. Louis that talks about um, building at the speed of trust or designing at the speed of trust, because many times we come into these spaces with agendas uh, and not really, again, think about how that's contributing to harm. But I will also challenge everyone to think about what communities I, am I actually a part of? Because I am personally tired of designers acting like that we're coming in as if we're these, uh, these you know, academic pedigree uh, experts or the professional pedigree experts and forget that the first thing we're coming up in, we should be coming in a space with is us being a community member ourselves. But we, we too many times come in with this veil and then wonder why we can't authentically try to get work done. And so we need to make sure that we are embedded in the communities in which we're doing the work and that we are also not at the same time in our good efforts erasing what's already happening in the community. Um, and if you are doing work in a community that's not yours, I would act, honestly challenge you to ask yourself, why am I actually here? And why am I not doing work in my own community in my own backyard, which to me is a, a major product of colonization mindset. And we see this in inter international development spaces and et cetera. We're so focused on everyone else because again, we wanna focus on empathy and center others and not really hold ourselves accountable to what we've done. Jordan, would you like to add on to that as well? Um. I mean, I would just say too, you probably know you ain't really been embedded in the work if you ain't been cussed out by a black person yet. So like, that's your litmus test, you know, or, or your continued litmus test, you're going to continue to show up and get cussed out, right? And you're going to get cussed out by people at the margins of the margin. So if you are black, you are a black designer showing up in community spaces and trying to bring your skills to the table, the organizers on the street are probably going to cuss you out at some point. And that's a good thing. Keep coming back. You know, keep coming back, show you're for real. If you're for real, you'll keep coming back. If you're not for real, you'll dip and that's that. I appreciate you guys. Um, 
the last question I want to ask this panel, it kind of goes back to a point that Terry you brought up a little bit earlier today around the ideas of intersections. So we're now at this point where as, as black people, we kind of have the floor based on some of the recent uh, atrocities that have happened. How do we use this opportunity in this moment to then um, also advocate for other people um, whether it be through intersections of identity or people that fall on the fringe, fringes, Jordan, as you mentioned, um, of, of, of um, external identities outside of our own. How do, we, how do we take this opportunity to advocate not just for our rights, but as Erwin said earlier, for the liberties of, of, of others as well who also need that advocacy? For me, I, I tend to really think about um, what spaces do I have the living expertise in the intersection of that? And what spaces uh, do I need to be um, what, what I like to call a design ally, not just an ally, you know, not just, again, something performative, but a design ally, someone that's doing the work with you. And so I tell, you know, for example, I give, you know, I can talk about and center my living expertise of being a black woman, but I can't talk about our center expertise of, of F F issues that impact the LGBTQIA plus community but I can leverage my power and access on behalf and with that community. Um, and so when I think about, you know, what we should be doing, you know, and, and Teresa talked about this earlier around, you know, equity and liberation, because sometimes we even talk about it through the lens of we need equality. <laughs> and it's like, don't, don't give me the same because one, this country was, or this iteration of the country, because let's be clear, there was already a country here before mass genocide occurred. So this iteration of the country was built on the backs of black folks. And so don't sit here and tell me that you're going to give me the same as other folks that was able to just lay in their they little bed and eat some damn cherries. Like you're not about to do that for me. What you need to provide me is something that actually will look at how do we give people you know, what they need for them to be their best and authentic self and not just give people what they need to survive, but give people what they need to thrive. Not just talk about, you know, how do we improve life expectancy, which is very important, but how do we also improve quality of life so that I actually, in the life that I have, you know, I feel like it was a good life. You know, my grandmother today, you know, we went to her funeral. She was 98 years old when she passed away. And one of the things that we learned that some of us didn't know is that she was the oldest out of all her family, and she was the only one that lied. Everyone prior to her had passed away, including her son, including her grandson, which was my grandfather her, and my uncle that I talk about a lot. And I know what it was like seeing her growing up because, and because I was with her when she was cleaning white people's homes. I used to be there with her. And while she was happy, there was also time you was like, man, she's she kind of mean, <laughs> you know? And, you, and, you, and you know, I always wonder why, why did she seem like she was angry? And you know what? She deserved to be angry because all the things that she continued to go through. And, you know, that's not just speaking to the fact of being black, but also speaking to the fact of in my family, there was also issues of black and then different abilities that, you know, status where my uncle leg was amputated before he passed away. And how do we have to navigate that as a family? And, you know, even when we talk about, for instance, the you know, accessibility movement, you know, we many times center white folks and not really think about the intersection of being black and also dealing with being neurodiverse or being differently able. Also being, having a different sexual orientation, being a trans man or trans woman or gender queer. There's so many different things that have been historically underinvested in this country. And that when we talk about Black Lives Matter, as Teresa said, it's about all black lives. And I mean, we need to think about the intersection of it all and include that in, my, in our movement work and not just center the ones that are cis, <laughs> that are, you know, black, cis, able-bodied and what we like to look at on a poster. You know, we need to also think about how others are trying to navigate the space with all this convoluted oppression and honestly still being asked to show joy. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, I show up as a Black queer woman. And so just to reemphasize that, yeah, I show up with my intersections and that is shown through all of my work. 
Um, you know, my personal relationship with oppression um, gives me room to consider and empathize with many of the oppressions, but I don't know it all, right? And so I think we need to be able to show up, I'm gonna use your language there, Antoinette, as the design ally, um, to be able not to just to say black lives, you can't say black lives matter and be homophobic or transphobic or ableist or classes. You can't, you can't do that because there's so many different intersections. Um, I think that that oppressive mentality is so detrimental to our movement because it doesn't, it not only divides our progress and what we're able to accomplish, but um, those oppressive, that oppressive ideology quite literally kills us in the streets. Like I can't talk about how much, we, how much um, the issue needs to, the light needs to be shed on the issue of black trans women um, dying in our streets because of transphobia. Um, and so as designers, whether we are black or not, we have a duty to create those experiences that honor and center the under um, invested. And so when I think about when I think about this, I think that justice, you know, justice isn't biased, right? Justice designs and creates for um, all of us who are in the margins of the margins, that intersectionality concept that Kimberly Crenshaw had brought to light. And so um, justice is anti-capitalist. It's um, anti-black capitalism. Justice isn't fair. Um, justice is right. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, I don't have an answer to additional answer. I just also want to say that don't also come up in this space talking about what's legal. <laughs> because if I could say many times there were like oppression has been legal for centuries in this country. And I can't tell you how many folks have come on my Facebook page to tell me when I am trying to center black folks or people of color in my hiring and thinking about where my money's going because racial wealth gap is a major issue. And if I'm trying to truly do work around racial equity, I can't just keep giving my funding to white led institutions. And I have had people come to me saying, that's not legal. Don't come to me about legality. You know, because when we look at the work that needs to also be done to really shift the systems, we're gonna have to also change what we mean by legal. <laughs> Lauren Jordan, would you guys like to add on to that as well? I, th I think if I one closing thought that I'd, I that I want to reemphasize that something that Terry said about you know to be um, to be really committed to Black liberation requires being anti capitalist, and I just want to I'm like I'm 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 there, and I'm trying like it's it's hard to pull a lot of people along because I think the expectation is um, we all want to do well, and the only way that we've seen to do well is to be capitalist black or not um but and i think like i've heard people talk earlier today about being at the table right or having a seat um and to like to beat the metaphor to death I, i'm like fuck the table right like <laughs> this table does not work the table is doing the harm that we're all talking about in every panel today um and so i'm, I'm really interested in how designers can completely think for example um, the ways that we work and the business models that we take up and the ways that we share wealth and profit um, and construct futures through the through the, the actual vehicles of, of producing design. And so I think it's some, it's like not cute. Nobody wants to talk about it because it, it, we haven't really seen it work in a way that's appealing to enough people for it, for it to become this mass movement. But I think um, whether it's just having the conversation about a, a co-op, if it's starting with like a studio co-op, which is more palatable than like a profit sharing, you know, worker owned co-op, whatever it is. Um, I think those are the conversations I really want to see designers have because they don't, they don't have answers yet, I don't think. And I think they're not sexy and they're not like, they, they're not quickly resolved. Um, and, and I do think we like things that kind of can be buttoned up that way. But I think if I could reemphasize anything, it would just be that, that there's no way for us to actually deal with any of the, any of this, any, any dimension of racism without really questioning, critiquing, and then just like blowing up what capitalism is and has been. Um, and so that would be, if, if I could give a parting word, that would be it. <laughs> I love it. Jordan? I 100% agree. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I want to take this time uh, before calling everybody back to, again, acknowledge my respect and admiration for the work that you guys all do. Um, there, in a lot of ways, is an underappreciation for a lot of the stuff that we do as designers and a lot of the stuff that you guys have accomplished in your own um, respects, in your own spaces. 
And one thing I remember that my mom used to always say to me, if anybody knows me, I'm always quoting my mom, but um, she used to say, the good that you do today may never be repaid to you directly, but it may be repaid to your children or your children's children. Even if it's as small of a gesture as you picked, you helped your neighbor bring their child to school the next day, that child may grow up and in turn do something for your child or your child's child because of the fact that you've done great work. And the thing that I really appreciate about all of you is that I see longevity and the impact that you guys will have. And if no one else tells you that, um, I appreciate all that you guys do. I take inspiration from what you guys do and it inspires me to, to continue doing what I'm doing. And I'm hoping that the people that watch this also take inspiration from the work that you do and the words that you've shared. Now, the one thing I wanna ask you guys, since we're a little bit over time already, is can you guys, which was an idea that Terrence shared, um, give us one word that sums up where you feel the state of black design is today. Whoever wants to jump in and go first is more than welcome to. I think Terrence has to go first, right? It's his idea. Hey, <laughs> okay, I'm cool with that, Terrence. <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to see if I am back. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Kind of dark. But um, so the state of black design, I'm, I'm actually hopeful for where we are right now because we have amazingly beautiful panels like this. And it's something that I never had access to um, before. I think if we all stick together, work hard and trust each other, uh, there's, there's a lot of space for us to uh, grow together. Awesome. Hopeful. There you go. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Maurice, I'd what do you say, think? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, like, um, wow. Uh, the, for the, where the state of Black design is right now, I would say it is, it is, uh, hmm, kinetic. That's more of an adjective, but like I feel there's a lot of movement that's happening in a lot of different spaces in a lot of different ways. And so uh, definitely kinetics. I love it. Larry. I was going to say, I think that we are um, at a renaissance period um, and, and, and black design being a major part of that. But I think that communication, <laughs> um, identity, all of those things are at a head right now. And I think that the uh, pandemic is sort of a, a, a brewing pot for a lot of things right now. And I think that we can use that energy in a really positive big bang kind of event um, in regard to black design, black creativity and blackness in general. So what was the one word? Uh, Renaissance. Renaissance. I don't, know how to, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to make that a, um, a well, yeah, just a, it's a Renaissance. <laughs> well, I'm going to say my word because uh, for the alliteration, so my word is radical. And I think radical usually takes on a negative connotation, but when it's a time to do something that's against the norm and is a big change and a shift, I think that's the type of movement that we need and just momentum that we need to be in, that it's gonna take just not little things, but big shifts um, to really radicalize systems, cultures, um, and the design space. I'm gonna say community, just because I think there's been a lot of events where we've talked about this. We've been seeing new faces, reaching out to more people. So especially the last three months, I've just felt so much community um, just come together. But I'm gonna leave it at that because it was one word. <laughs> I, I can jump in here. I think the word I would use would be, and I don't know if this is the right word, but to me, it sums it up. I would say emboldened because I think we really have to stand out as we always have done, right? This isn't a time for us to shrink back. So if there are young people watching this live stream and I hope they are, 
be emboldened. Whereas they say in Jamaica, big up your chest, right? With come with pride, right? Big it up. Yeah. Have the pride. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my word is going to be emancipatory because if I don't say emancipatory, it wouldn't be me, right? Um, and I think ema emancipation and emancipatory, um, that is about liberation and freedom and self-focus. And so me, that is like what is really important about Black design, you know, doing Black design for us, for Black people to tell our own stories, to um, emancipate us from whatever is holding us back. Um, you guys are so positive, but you know I'm not going there. I think my one, my one word is complicated, right? You know, it's it's complicated in the where we are, where we're gonna be, how we're gonna do this, when is it gonna happen, who gonna make it happen? What, like, it's complex in this, and I think in understanding that it is complicated, the complexity is because we know this. It's how we should prepare, prepare. It's how we should be. It's how we should position ourselves. It's how we need to be able to activate and advocate for others. Um, I'll go next. Disruptive, period. I'll say uh, entitled, and that's a word usually um, reserved for uh, white people. And I'm thinking about the advice I got from a Black woman who was an art director who put me on my path to design. And she said, go about your business like a mediocre white man who feel entitled. So I was like, all right, I'll do that. <laughs> so I think Black people, um, the young folks who are listening, especially the Black designers, feel entitled, you know, that you are owed what you're owed. And so to jump off of Sam, so anti-compliance. So in, in a system where we're expected to supply and to to kind of feel, you know, marginalized and, and oppressed, like we can't comply with these expectations that that society has for us and we can't comply with um with 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 the societal norms and and how we're, we're expected to act and how we're expected to be um especially as you know folks just try to control every move that we make and every decision and every design and and they try to control the spaces that we're in so anti-compliant and then um also alive um so you know, just been so oppressed by so much death and just so much that, that that's happened for decades to our people. Um, and that will probably still continue to happen. Um, but I just wanna be able to focus on the life that we should all appreciate and that we should just seek within ourselves and, and in each other. I say dope, just dope. So my word is rageful and I feel like it requires an explanation. So please don't um, <laughs> clown me in the comments. Um, so I'm rageful is usually it has this negative connotation, um, but I'm doing some work around rage right now. And I feel like there's ways in which it, it fuels my work personally. Um, and I hope I, it's, it's an aspirational word because I don't actually think most black designers in the world are as rageful as we could be. <laughs> um, and so I would hope that we could amplify that. Um, as we as we go ahead. Is that everyone? Am I the last one? I think so. Oh, cool. Hyphen word. Legacy shaping. Good night. Well, all right, you guys, I'd like to thank you guys all for participating. I'd like to thank everybody who actually tuned into the broadcast. Please find these designers on LinkedIn, support their endeavors, um, and let us know if there's future events like this that you'd like us to host. We'd like to thank you guys again. Um, all of our panelists, I'd ask you guys to pause, well, turn your mics off and your camera off so we can end the broadcast and then convene afterwards. Everybody, you guys have a good night. Take care. <laughs>